This statue of Lao Quan and his sons, which may have adorned the home of the Roman Emperor Titus and is currently in the Vatican's collection of antiquities, has baffled and frustrated art critics since its rediscovery in 1506. The key source of contention comes from the expression made by the maid figure. The sculpture is meant to depict Lao Quan reaping divine punishment for his attempts to warn his fellow Trojans against accepting the wooden horse their Greek adversaries left at the gate of the city. His eyes evince great suffering, but the lines in his forehead are as serene and even contemplative. Figures as diverse as William Blake and Charles Darwin have complained about the statue because of this. French neurologist Guillaume Benjamin Amand Duchesne even tried to get human subjects to recreate the expression by applying electric shocks to them. He concluded that Lao Quan's face is anatomically impossible. In the latter half of the 19th century, art historians began speculating that the sculptor's distortion of human anatomy may not have been a mistake. After all, the passage in Virgil's Aeneid that depicts the fate of Lao Quan is primarily concerned with duality and coupling. In his moment of doom, Lao Quan is split between feelings of hopeless torment and vain focus. Perhaps the sculptor, unwilling to choose between one motif and the other, decided to fudge realism and portray both sensations at the same moment. By the standards of some, the resulting piece feels emotionally honest even if the facial expression is not a literal transcription of physical reality. Michelangelo may have agreed. He greatly admired the statue, and more than a few art historians note parallels between Lao Quan's pose and the one found in Michelangelo's The Dying Slave. Following the advent of photography, fine art began moving away from literal depictions of the material and more into the subjective realm. The Impressionists became more interested in capturing the essence of a moment in time, usually at the expense of recreating every little detail in the moment. Their successors took things even further, drawing upon the emerging discipline of psychology to create art that was meant to explore the interiority of the human mind. Philosophies such as existentialism, nihilism, Marxism, and others also colored the direction of fine art movements in the late 19th and early 20th century. Joined with a trend for appropriating the traditional artwork of Africa, Asia, the Middle East, the Pacific Islands, and the indigenous segments of Australia and the Americas, leading artists frequently abandoned realism and faith of a surreal, unreal, or even fully abstracted form of expression that was supposed to represent moods or ideas rather than the tangible world. In other words, a subjective reality was, by these perspectives, considered more truthful than an attempt to build an objective one. So, with all that in mind, what can this, admittedly streamlined, view on modernist art history tell us about Rob Liefeld? I'm going to connect the preceding narrative to Liefeld's artistry in an attempt to explain why Liefeld struck a chord with the zeitgeist of his time, but before I do that, I should probably expand upon the man's background and reputation. So if you'll indulge me in yet another exposition dump, for the uninitiated, Rob Liefeld is a comic book artist who grew up in Anaheim, California. As a child, he developed a drawing ability by tracing over the work of artists like George Perez, Mike Zeck, Bob Layton, John Romita Jr., and Arthur Adams. Liefeld caught the attention of Megaton publisher Gary Carlson, and by the time he was 19, he was getting work from DC and Marvel Comics. After a Hawk and Dove miniseries, Liefeld became the regular penciler on X-Men spin-off The New Mutants. Ranking among the lowest-selling X titles before Liefeld's arrival, it became one of Marvel's most popular comics soon after. With writer Louise Simonson, Liefeld co-created Cable, a time-traveling cyborg who took over leadership of the New Mutants and pushed the team into becoming more proactive and even aggressive. Sensing that Liefeld was responsible for the title's success, Marvel Editorial gave him more creative control with its 98th issue. With writer Fabian Nicieza adding dialogue to Liefeld's plots, the quippy, anti-heroic Deadpool was then added to the New Mutants roster. Liefeld and Nishieza rebranded the New Mutants with the more assertive and timely name of X-Force in 1991. This comic debuted at the zenith of a comic book speculator bubble. The 1980s saw numerous human interest stories where someone came across old comic books and were astonished to find that certain people were willing to buy them for massive sums of money. This led many to begin buying comics as an investment, especially when it came to first issues, the debut issues for new characters, or issues where prominent characters were killed. Marvel 
Marvel and DC exploited this bubble by printing hundreds of thousands of comics that played up to this hype. X-Force number one, for example, was sold in a poly bag with one of five trading cards in the hopes that collectors would buy multiple copies. This gimmick succeeded, and X-Force number one sold four million copies, setting an industry record that would be broken the following year by Chris Claremont and Jim Lee's infamous X-Men relaunch. Liefeld, at this point, became about as famous as a comic book artist can get. He even starred in a Levi's commercial directed by Spike Lee. Feeling that he wasn't getting his fair share of the money he was bringing into Marvel, Liefeld split with the company in 1992 and formed Image Comics alongside Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, Eric Larson, Wills Portacio, Mark Silvestri, and Jim Valentino. Unlike the work-for-hire arrangement at Marvel and DC, Image would be a creator-owned publisher where the writers and artists would, in theory if not always in practice, control the characters they built and developed. Image's maiden title was Liefeld Youngblood, put together through his Extreme Studios subdivision. Youngblood, a hyper-violent superhero team reflective of Liefeld's affection for the Teen Titans, received a poor critical reception, but still reaped blockbuster sales thanks to the speculator bubble. Subsequent Image debuts, including McFarlane's Spawn, Larson's Savage Dragon, and Lee's Wildcats, also earned sales that briefly rivaled Batman and Spider-Man. Animation deals and merchandising lines soon followed. Alas, the speculator bubble eventually burst in the mid-1990s. Collectors finally figured out that old comics were only valuable because they were considered disposable in their day and, as such, were pretty scarce in modern times. All those copies of Death of Superman currently floating around are common as muck, and as such, are unlikely to fund anyone's college tuition. Liefeld's brand suffered further because of intercompany squabbling with his image peers, his work taking a noticeable dive in quality, and his inability to hit a deadline. Liefeld's created books such as Glory, Bloodstrike, Prophet, and Evangeline failed to make much of a mark, at least in their first iterations. Marvel, in an attempt to spark interest in some of their more old-fashioned properties, lured Liefeld back to produce revamps for Captain America and the Avengers. Displeased with the creative direction and late shipping, Liefeld was released from his year-long contract after about six issues of each title. Liefeld's Captain America run in particular has become a popular punching bag for snarky comic nerds. In the decades since his heyday, Liefeld has become a symbol for everything that was wrong with American superhero comics in the early 1990s. In fact, most of the ire directed at 90s superhero comics in general are usually citations of Liefeldisms, even if the man's name isn't specifically mentioned. There is, of course, the anatomical issues, huge muscles that cleft in bizarre positions, and the infamous inability to draw feet, often resulting in billowing smoke that conveniently hides anything below the shin. There are the massive guns, belts, swords, bracelets, shoulder pads, and pouches that appear and disappear between panels with no rhyme or reason. There's the conspicuous lack of backgrounds, off-putting figure placement, and laughably incorrect perspective. And since the early 1990s saw an emerging market where comic artists could make a lot of money by selling their original pages to private collectors, panel-to-panel -panel storytelling was de-emphasized in order to fit more dynamic character poses on the page. A big splash page of a popular superhero would net more at auction than a functional nine-panel grid of characters talking to each other. So, 90 superhero comics saw pin-up style posing shove visual storytelling away from editorial priority. Since Liefeld was his own boss, he was surrounded by friends and sycophants who weren't motivated to question his choices. Like most American superhero publishers of the 90s, Extreme Studios saw the art as the primary selling point of comics and put writing in a secondary position. Because of this, half-faked writing was often paired with flashy art that had little to no sense of visual narrative. After Youngblood was criticized for being a jumbled, unreadable mess, Liefeld had the first four issues re-dialogued for their paperback collection. Whether this affected the thin characterization and incoherent plot has been a matter of debate ever since. Liefeld was far from the only artist who indulged in such practices, but he was among the most popular and he had many, many imitators. While he has frequently been ridiculed for his aesthetic in the years since 1992, I want to stress that he has never failed to find a new platform for his projects. Cable and especially Deadpool have become household names, which keeps Liefeld in the public eye even if one can argue that Liefeld had nothing to do with the most beloved incarnations of either character. It should also be noted that, speculator bubble or not, there were plenty of kids who bought and read Rob Liefeld comics because they liked them. It's far from impossible to find millennial comic fans who sincerely believe that Rob Liefeld is a great artist. 
I want to make it clear that I'm not arguing that Rob Liefeld is a great artist because he was popular in the early 90s. Artistic greatness is a subjective term, and there's no objective means to qualify it. Furthermore, widespread public appeal in a hyper-specific time period is far from a reliable metric for perceived artistic value, especially in the long term. Plenty of artistic projects were met with tremendous commercial success upon release and then faded to irrelevance and obscurity in the years since. There's honestly no way to tell if Rob Liefeld to be fondly remembered by later generations, and I'm not going to even attempt to make a prediction. That being conceded, it's inarguable that Rob Liefeld's art, regardless of its quality, made an impact. Millions of people connected with it, despite or maybe even because of the elements that drew criticism and mockery. I think the question of why that could be is a lot more interesting than yet another treatise about why Rob Liefeld is a hacky garbage artist. So whether you personally hate his stuff or not, it's incontrovertible that millions of people are into it. Since that's the case, why do people like Rob Liefeld? What's his appeal? I would argue that Liefeld's strengths lie in the visceral impact of his drawing. While his figures are distorted to the realm of the grotesque, they never fail to grab the eye. His work has an unbounded quantity of energy and enthusiasm that usually only manifests in the doodles of a middle schooler's notebook. Liefeld's pages are convinced that they're showing you the coolest stuff imaginable. They're excited about all this cool stuff to the point where nobody stopped to look up a visual reference for any of the cool stuff. I think writer Gail Simone said it best in a promotional interview where she was plugging a Teen Titans collaboration she did with Liefeld. She remarked, I like that some of Rob's pages reach out and slap you in the face. I find that vastly preferable to the sedate, slumbering style that so many superhero comics have fallen into. My son, who loves manga and has no interest in superhero comics, came into my office while I was looking at Rob's sketches and he asked who drew them. He's never done that before, and he specifically asked when this book was coming out. One look and he was hooked. In a nutshell, Youngblood is what would happen if one stuffed a blender with Reagan-era action movies, American Gladiators, Hulk Hogan-era professional wrestling, blood-soaked video games, old shonen manga, hair metal music videos, various bits of extreme sports iconography, and a version of Miracle Man or Watchmen devoid of postmodern commentary. That sounds like a big old mess, and it is, but that also means that Liefeld's heroes are a perfect approximation of how many an 11-year-old boy would picture words like awesome or badass, especially if you asked an 11-year-old boy in 1991. Getting back to my original point, strict adherence to proper anatomy and perspective is not a prerequisite for an acclaimed or enduring work of art. In fact, medieval drolleries, expressionistic vistas, cubist portraits, and many other works would lose both their appeal and meaning if they were refashioned in a more realistic idiom. To bring things back to comics, many of Liefeld's apologists love to point out that industry titan Jack Kirby was also a self-taught artist with an idiosyncratic approach to anatomy and perspective. Also, so, not unlike Liefeld, Kirby employed a number of artistic cheats to keep his output ahead of deadline, although Kirby was inarguably more successful than Liefeld in that realm. While I personally consider Kirby's aesthetic to be a lot more pleasing to the eye than what Liefeld produces, I can't claim that this argument is inherently wrong on its face. As I mentioned before, Liefeld's stints on X-Force and Youngblood don't have much in the way of plot or characterization. The overblown, exaggerated energy is the sole thing working for these books. While there there are later versions of Liefeld properties that found success without the man's direct involvement, those creative teams had to flesh things out and bring new things to the table. Liefeld is a singular entity. Despite the copycats, only Rob Liefeld could be Rob Liefeld. To summarize and conclude, I'd like to reiterate that I'm not claiming that Rob Liefeld is a surpassing talent and that his detractors don't have a leg to stand on. Speaking purely for myself, I don't care for his approach to the medium and I feel that most of the common criticisms are on point. With this allowance made, however, I do not feel the sense of bafflement that Liefeld's harshest critics routinely exclaim. I can't inhabit the mind of another person and see the world through their eyes, but I can listen and empathize when this person shares their feelings. And while I don't think Liefeld will ever appeal to me personally, I think I get it. The eyebrows don't have to match the forehead in order to relate a genuine feeling. The feet don't have to plausibly support a character's weight in order for them to leave a lasting ripple on the adolescent psyche. Who cares what all those pouches are supposed to be for anyways?
Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to support me, I've set up a link tree for my various artistic projects. I update a webcomic called Poetry Comics, which adapts classic verse to the comics medium alongside original content and abstract material. I run a movie dork podcast called Real Deep Dive with my friends and family, and of course there are these videos. I'm going to try to put one of these out a month for the foreseeable future. Uh, like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications if you are inclined.